Hello everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Um, today I'm pretty excited because it's been a long time since I posted a video. I'm super sorry about that. Life's crazy. Um, but today I want to do something completely different. Um, I did a lot of research lately on a kind of mystery that's been, that happened back in 1959. And I heard it on a podcast called Morbid, which I highly recommend. So, so recommend. They're so freaking great. Um, I'm going to link them, link their information down below so you can find them. Um, but I listened to their podcast um, about a year ago and heard this case and was like, what the heck? And it just like kind of sits in my head and I think about it sometimes. So I want to look more into it because you can only get so much information from one podcast for an hour. So... Uh, oh my gosh, there's a lot of information on this case. It's really, really crazy, but there's also not a lot of information on this case because of like, I don't know, I think some people try to cover some stuff, up, but we'll get into that. So anyways, um, this is going to be a long video, so probably get a snack. Um, I'm going to be doing my makeup while I do this because I want to do my makeup while I talk about this. So that's going to be a thing. And yeah, so yeah, if you want to do your makeup, awesome. Get a snack because it is going to be a long time and it's creepy. Um, I'm probably, I don't know if I'm going to post pictures of, like, creepy stuff, but I do want to let you guys know this does talk about death and decomposition and autopsies and stuff like that. So, just so there's a warning, if you're not into stuff like that, probably don't watch this video. But if you are into stuff like that and you're into mysteries, then we'll just move forward. So, around. um, back in... So late January, it was like January 25th, 1959. So a group of 10 hikers from the Ural Polytechnical University um, were going on a um, an expedition or a trek, um, whatever you want to call it. Oh, sorry. Any of the products that I'm using, I will try to list below. I'll try to get it all down there for you guys. Um, but yeah, so they were going on... Um, some people call it a ski trip, but actually they were all very, very qualified. They were at grade two and they planned this expedition um, for them to get their grade three, which grade three is like the master level. I did look up some information about like grades and hiking and uh, like the levels and stuff like that. I think it's different for every country. I'm not exactly sure. It's a little confusing for me. I'm not into wilderness, so maybe it doesn't make sense to me, but it might make sense to you. Look it up if you want. But for Russia at this time, and this is like right after World War II, the Cold War, whatever, the Joe Stalin situation had just recently been a thing. So um, yeah, so the grade three was what they were going to try to get. And to achieve a grade three, I had to write it down, sorry. But to achieve a grade three, you have to hike. Um, it has to be 186 miles of ground that's covered. And that needs to be broken up into like chunks. So a third of that 186 miles needs to be very challenging terrain. And then it has to be for a minimum of 16 days for at least that long to get through the 186 miles. And then eight of those days, so half, at least half of that needs to be in an uninhabited area where there's no village, nothing like that. You're like straight up in wilderness. And then six of those days or six of the 16 days needs to be in a tent. So <clears throat> it's a really, really hard trek. It's a hard level to get. But once you get that level, you are a master and then you can train people. You can take people on treks and trips and stuff like that. So that's what they wanted to do. And so they planned for it to be uh, hard. And actually the natives from that area, the Mansi tribe, actually set out the trail for them to make sure that they'd be able to make it through. Um, and so they had that laid out for them. And the Mansi actually, so they were trying to hike to mountain, Mount or Torton. And that actually translates for the Mansi people don't go there. So just keep, I don't know, I just think that's kind of a creepy thing for considering what happened to these people. So, um, shortly before the event or the incident, um, they stopped in a village and one of the trekkers, 
uh, had chronic issues, I wanted to say rheumatoid, and he was not able to continue on. Um, I'll give you the name of the hikers right now. Okay, keep in mind, this is from the Russian. I don't speak good Russian at all, and English is even hard for me, so I'm trying, I won't, I'll try not to slaughter these names, but please do forgive me. I mean, no, no disrespect. So, um, the leader of the group is Igor Dyatlov, and he was born January 13th, 1936. And then we have, there's a lot of Yuris, just keep in mind, so I might call them by their last name, but there's Yuri Duroshenko, and he was born January 29th, 1938. And there is Lou Milda, or Laya Milda, um, Dubanina, and she is one of the two females on this trek, so go girl. And she is born May 12th, 1938. Then there's, I don't know if it's Georgie or Yorgi. Um, Karovanashenko, sorry, uh, his birthday is February 7th, 1935. So all these people, other than one, are they're like 23, 22, 20 years old, they're like early, early 20s, okay, just keep that in mind. Um, then we have Alexander uh, Kolot Kolotov, Kolovitov, and then we have uh, Zin Zina, Zina Ida, but I'm... Oh. <laughs> Colomor Colmoral. I'm gonna have their names up here so you guys can see them. I'm so sorry I'm slaughtering them. So Zin Zinadia Chlor Olamiba. I'm gonna call her Zina. And then there's Restum Solobodin. And then Nikolai. Um, they call him Kolia. And then we have Semyon Um Zolotarava, and his birthday is February 2nd. 1921. He was 38 years old at the time of the incident. And then there's Yori Yudin. Yori Yudin is the one that was injured, or not injured, but he was too ill to carry on. So he's one that stayed behind and then nine continued on after. Um, he is actually a big part of helping in the case or in this, uh, looking into this incident. And he gives a lot of good information that I, I like Yori Yudin. So, uh, Yor Yudin stayed, and then the other trekkers continued on, and um, so Zina, she uh, she was the secretary, I guess, of the group. So she kept a log or a diary of everything they did, everywhere that they went. So she kept a very, very good log. And then another one of the hikers also always had his journal with him, and Yudin said that he never didn't have that. He always had that journal with him. So, um, keep that in mind. So, they trekked on. So, they kept going and they decided to set up camp at the slope of a mountain. And they set up camp here because they wanted to just be able to hurry and pack up camp early in the morning and get going to get on to Mount or Torton. Um, the mountain that they say don't go there. So, um, from there, uh, so early morning, so February 1st, uh, they were setting up the camp and uh, wanted to be able to leave early the next morning. And it was early in the morning of February 2nd that all nine hikers died. And it was by February 12th, they were supposed to get in contact with Yuri Yudin and they didn't. Um, he wa I did think, okay, maybe give them a couple days, but the next semester of school, because remember they're all from the university, um, the next semester of school or school is going to be starting back up again as of February 16th, and he was expecting to hear from them February 12th. He did not hear from them. February 16th came and went. Um, by February 20th, he raised the alarm to authorities in the village that he was in waiting for them, and then on February 26th, they found the campsite completely destroyed. And what's weird is the evidence shows that the tent itself, their shelter, was shredded from the inside out. So all none of them were in the tent and something had scared them or panicked them enough that they wanted to 
they needed to get out of the tent so bad they shredded it to get out and all of the footprints show that they scattered they did not stay in a group which for that grade of hiking you know that in wilderness and in especially oh by the way there's a huge blizzard windstorm going on outside of the tent and they all scattered and destroyed their only shelter to do so so something bad or something scary must have been going on for them to panic like that and searchers were continuing on they actually had a lot of volunteers and leaders from the Mansi tribe were helping with the search as well and it was actually one of the elders with his German Shepherd that found the first two bodies so the first two hikers that were found were Yuri Durashenko and Georgie or Yorgi uh, Krivonashenko and uh, they were found laying together both were in their underwear I don't know if they're like boxers or like the long drawn underwear but they were not dressed and the footprints le like scattering away from the site shows that they left either barefoot some had socks one had one boot or one shoe and then I don't know if they're barefoot or socked but not prepared to be going out there and so they're literally out in negative 24 degree weather in the wilderness in a blizzard in their underwear they were so panicked that's how they left so um they did have like a fire they had like a crude little fire that they had made but and then the branches of the tree that they were found under were cracked and um, you could see that they were broken down, but it looked like they were actually trying to climb up the tree because they did find, like, skin and flesh in the bark of the tree. Like, they were panicking trying to climb up the tree, and their hands both showed evidence of them climbing up the tree. Um, so Yuri's injuries, he had burns um, to the side of his head. His ears, nose, and lips were covered in blood. Um, he had multiple bruises and abrasions on his hands and arms and torso, and he was found um, with a foamy gray discharge around his mouth, and the doctors later said that that would be from an immense pressure being put on his chest. Um, and then Yorgi, or uh, yeah, Kronoshenko, his injuries were bruises to his forearm, um, left temporal bone, skin missing from his hands, arms, and legs, again climbing up the tree in your underwear, and then he actually had a like piece of skin in his mouth. We don't really, I don't know what that's about, and it didn't really go into why, but that was what it was. And then continuing on, so then after finding the first two, they did find three more hikers, um, which is Igor Dyatlov, the leader, um, Zina, the secretary, as well as Slobodin. And um, when they found Igor, his, uh, his body was found with his arms like crossed over his chest, holding a birch branch in like a defensive pose. And he was found with uh, no gloves or shoes. He only had on socks and he was also holding a picture of Zena because they were actually dating and his watch showed 531. Um, and then when they found Zena, her arms were twisted beneath her and her legs were bent, almost like it seemed as if she had collapsed in the middle of climbing. And she was found on her right side and uh, she had no shoes, just socks. She also had dried blood on her face and her skin was darker. And also Igor's like sister mentioned that his hair was white and his skin was aged. Um, so both of them, all three of these last hikers, they did notice that their skin was very aged um, compared to what it should have been. Uh, but then again, they were in horrible conditions. So there's that to keep in mind. And then for Slobodin, he was found face down in the snow, and he did have blood all over his um, nose and face. He had swelling, bruises, and abrasions on both sides of his face, and uh, skin was ripped off of his right forearm, which they are not so sure about, but again, um, they're on the mountains. There was about a 24 
foot drop off of a rocky ledge. Um, so that could have, you know, there's, there's a lot of situations that ran out, but it did seem like these last three were going back to try to find the situation, like, you know, find where their shelter was. It, that's what it seemed like. He actually had a fracture to his skull that was seven inches long and severely deep and uh, blunt force trauma uh, to the head like that, they feel like probably caused a lot of disorientation for him, especially in those conditions. So that's just terrifying. And he was also found with no jacket, but he did have a cap on. Um, he had several pairs of socks, but no shoes. Well, he, or he had one shoe. He was the one that had the one shoe on, um, but he did have a cap, no jacket. Okay, so they found two hikers together, like a group of two, and then they found a group of three. So that's five out of the nine, and <clears throat> they did not find the other four hikers for another few months. Actually, not until May were they able to thaw out the ground long enough to get to them. Um, so the last four hikers were actually found. They had dug themselves holes into the ground and then cut like lined the holes with um birch branches to like and <clears throat> like you think that's weird like okay you're freezing to death so bury yourself in snow but actually um what reports show and uh what that would be actually good advice and that is a professional ass move to do because they actually that stops their body from having contact from the wind blowing up because they're below ground and then two their body won't have contact with the snow and that's why they lined it with the birch branches so there's that so with the ground thawing um their bodies were not found in the best condition um they couldn't tell uh, a lot about them but they did get a lot of information I was actually able to find the autopsy reports for these ones and it uh, it's pretty brutal for some of them so I just want to give you guys a warning right now it gets pretty um, grotesque and brutal for what I'm going to describe first we'll talk about Nicola Nicolai and uh, Colia and he was so he's one of the ones that they unburied and uh he had fatal skull injury and uh, multiple fractures to his temporal bone a uh, big bruise to his upper lip and a hemorrhage to the lower forearm like a huge huge dark bruise and they couldn't figure out if that was from a fall but again there was a 24 foot to like drop off of a like a rocky ledge so they do believe that some of them did fall off of that ledge and it does make sense for some of their wounds but uh some of their wounds were a little more harder impact from just a fall and that's where some of the mystery lies pretty creepy so anyways they um they next found uh, Alexander Kolet Koletov, and his injuries um, were a broken nose, and he had like a deformed neck. I don't really know exactly what that means, but uh, something had happened to his neck, but it did look like he had died from hypothermia, from what they could tell. But again, some of these people were kind of like the ground had thawed and melted and muddy and so it wasn't very good for how they were able to decompose. Um, and then after that, let's go with Semyon um, Zavteryov. I'll put the names up again. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering them. He was the 38 year old male that um, that was with the group. So he was like the, he was a lot older than most of the group, but he, um, was kind of put on last minute. Um, so his eyeballs were both removed from his body and his injuries also consisted of five ribs on both sides being crushed and an open wound that exposed bone on the side of his head. And then, um, we'll, we'll go back to him, but pretty severe wounds. Um, the worst 
situation of them all was the last hiker and that is Lumidia, um, I'm sorry, Ludmilia uh, Dubanina and her injuries were so extensive I'm kind of just going to read them off so I apologize if I'm a little distracted. Um, okay, so her injuries consist of her nasal cartilage. Her nose was completely busted. The nasal, the cartilage itself was completely flattened, like just flat. And uh, her upper lip and uh, had soft tissue damage around the eyes and eyebrows. Both of her eyes were also removed. Her tongue was also removed in a way that it seemed it was ripped out of her body from the root. Her tongue, right out. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, she had four broken ribs on the right side of her body and then four broken ribs, uh, six broken ribs on the left side of her body and a massive hemorrhage in her heart, which they say that is the cause of her death. So just to make sure it's understood, she was like, they found coagula coagulated blood, so blood that had time to thicken inside of her stomach from, they believe, from her, where her tongue was removed, which means that it can continue to bleed, which means that it was removed before death. So just keep that in mind. Dupanina's autopsy report shows that her death was of violence, and it does show that at the end of the autopsy reports. I want to say for at least the last four, um... But it seemed like the last four, the ones that were, it seemed like they lived a few hours longer than the others, um, seemed like theirs were a little bit harder than the first five. So I don't know. I feel like they had different experiences after the situation of whatever scared them out of their tent. Um, where are they? So, okay. so now I want to move, now that we know the deaths and who they are and everything, um, I want to kind of go over the theories. So after, there's like, of course, like a military theory, um, but there's some weird stuff. So after the first five were found, the families actually had a really hard time getting their bodies back for their funeral. And uh, the government, or not the government, let's say that it was actually the Soviets were trying to, so I guess the government, um, kept trying to pressure the families to do one mass uh grave at the site where they found the hikers and they actually kept trying to be shady about it and we're going to like some of the family members being like to Igor's family members and being like oh well we already talked to the other family members and they want to do the mass grave so you're going to be the only one stopping that da, 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 da. but none of them gave in they all were like no we want to give them a funeral they deserve that um the families are actually pretty upset and we're like upset with the university like why are you letting them go on a hike like that but again they were very qualified they knew what they were doing and from journal entries and pictures that were taken um it shows that they did stay on the trail that was laid out for them um anyways so they were able to get the bodies back and they but then uh the soviets were like okay fine but you can't have one giant funeral you have to split it up so it has to be one funeral for these ones at this date and one funeral for these ones on this date and people reported that they recognized like soviet officers in civilian closings like undercover at the funerals to see what people were saying and kind of trying to like mitigate who went to the funeral and why and but why would they need to do that why put forth effort on trying to see what was going on at the funeral. But at the funeral, people did report that there was a deep orange tint to their skin and why was their hair white? And actually Igor's sister said the only way they were able to recognize him because he looked like he had aged so long was because he had a notable gap between his front teeth. And that's how they were able to be like, oh, okay, that is him. Other than that, he was unrecognizable. And so after this, they did find the last four hikers, and for the last four, they didn't get to have a funeral at all. It was family members only, and it was actually only done in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> so not much of a funeral at all for them, which is actually pretty sad, but they were trying to like keep it calm or whatever. Um, the investigation was like extremely rushed. Uh, <clears throat> people felt like they didn't get the attention 
that they needed to and it wasn't done the right way. Um, the, they did actually close the site for three years after the deaths and still to this day the Soviets don't like people talking about it or bringing it up. But um, some of the theories, and this is where Yuri Yudin comes in, he actually um, was able to go to the site and identify whose belongings were where because they, it's nine people, I'm sorry, ten people with him, and they all have a pack. So they all have, you know, like, this is what I have, this is what you have. They have responsibilities of what they're carrying for the group and what they have for themselves. So it's not hard to figure out whose is what what, and he was able to identify that. But he did also report and testify that he saw government documents, official documents, dating two weeks before the 26th of February, so two weeks before they started the search for them. Um showing that there was already an investigation into the situation. And at that point, that's even, I want to say, still before he realized something had happened. So that's what kind of set up some flags for him. And then he also found uh, there was a full set of skis that did not belong to anybody in the group. There was a camera around one of the hikers' necks that was not seen before. And you didn't actually um, accuse uh, Zol Zolotarov of maybe hiding, having that and hiding it during the hike, which, why would you want to do that? Why would you need to do that? Um, but he was an officer in World War II, so he is, he does have military ties, and they thought that was kind of strange. And <clears throat> also, um, there was one of the hikers, he was known to always, always, always have his diary on him, as well as Zena. She was a very, very good secretary. She was always taking pictures and writing things down, and they did have a lot of information, knowing that they stayed on the trail because of how she kept good records. But the one guy, his uh, diary was never found, which is weird. So there's that. Then there's also, um, there was another group that was shadowing the group on their hike. They were a few weeks behind. And they reported showing, or reported seeing bright lights, um, like going from like north to south and then east to west, like in the sky, just flying not naturally, like the way anything in the sky they've seen do normally. Um, <clears throat> one guy even reported thinking that he was so freaked out by these huge orbs that he actually thought it was another planet from outer space going to be colliding with Earth. Could you imagine how freaky that would be? I, oh my God, I would lose my mind. There's no way I could handle that. Like, I don't want to think about that, it's too much. Lev Ivanov, he was um, one of the lead investigators and the prosecutor on the case. And he was very interested in the orbs. And they were reported in January, February, March, and April. So before and after the incident that people were reporting these. And that's when, you know, they, they are not just reported from civilians, it's from military officers. Um, the other hikers that were shadowing the same trek that the Dyatlov group was going. Um, and he actually was very open about saying that he had no doubt that those orbs had a direct link to the deaths of this group and he felt that it was murder and he was the prosecutor on the case at the time and he continued to talk about that pretty openly and then he was called to Russia and when he came back from Russia his behavior was notably different. Uh, he seemed to actually have aged himself from the stress that he was under all of a sudden and he did not talk about murders anymore and he stopped talking about the orbs and he also advised others to hold their tongue when asked. Um, they also had to report or re remove anything from of the orbs or anything mentioning them from their reports but some of his reports did note that pines, full-grown pines, the tops of them were burnt on, like scorched on the top. How does that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Um, another one of the, and like people like to think that like the military is trying to cover things up, um, because what if they were testing some sort of weird weapons? There's like a radiological weapons testing theory going on that maybe they got hit with some waves and that caused the panic. And then once they figured out like, oh, okay, like we're normal. I don't know, it's like infra, infrasound. Like they mess with the waves in your ears and 
uh, it causes panic and things like that. That's one of the theories. I don't know a lot about that stuff, but it is kind of strange um, to think that, I don't know, their, their government can do anything. They have, they have secrets. They don't tell us all everything. Um, another thing is, the people were trying to think that maybe it was the Mansi tribe. Maybe they were upset because the group had gone onto a sacred land, but that's actually not the case. The Mansis again helped with the search, um, and they helped lay out the trail for them to keep them safe. And it was not sacred land. They looked into that. It was not sacred land. Um, <clears throat> When they did get there, though, they did see the tent, and the poles were standing up, but it was shredded in between. I'll try to put a picture up for you guys to see it. And so a lot of people were saying that the wind had swept them, the campers, away. But that doesn't make any sense, because why was the tent still, like, it was on, it was structurally sound and set into the ground very well. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why were they all undressed? That's the huge question, like, why in the world would you go out at negative 24 degrees weather? And remember, these people are very experienced. They know what the weather's like. They know what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. They should know it at, like, pretty much any point of this trip. They should not be in their underwear for any long period of time. So the fact that they were all very underdressed was super stressful. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to also mention the four hikers that were buried and found buried they had like extra clothing on like um dubanina she had like ripped jacket sleeves um uh, wrapped around her feet they found out that that ripped jacket sleeve was from one of the other five hikers um one of their jackets had been ripped and the sleeve was used um, she had a short sleeve shirt on. She had very many layers of clothing, and so did the other hikers that were buried underneath. So it seems like they had time to figure things out and get more clothing on. And then the other hikers, the first five they found, it seemed like they were in a panic. The two had died. The three were trying to go back. I'm not sure exactly. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. So, <clears throat> anyways, they, um, they think one of the reasons that they were... Uh, undressed like that is paradoxical undressing which kind of leads into the infrasound kind of theory where it's like a vibration that hits like a certain octave in your inner ear that makes you like crazy makes you have feelings of panic and the paradoxical undressing is actually I want to say Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the infrasound, but it has to do with like a type of hypothermia where your body starts to tell yourself that you're actually really hot, you're not freezing, and you start taking off your clothing. But um, I'm not sure if that's a thing. I'm not sure if that's what happened to them. But the infrasound thing, that's, I don't know, stuff like that freaks me out. The government has tricks like that up their sleeve. And they're in the in the mountains, so like at that time there was was a lot of government stuff going on so you never know but um let's see okay and so the mansi people when they were helping with the search and they found the state of the of the camp they had a pretty good idea of what had caused it and they have a legend and it is my firm belief that if you if there's a native uh, like legend or whatever, just believe it. Like, don't think it's just, oh, it's just superstition. Just believe it. They've been there. They were there longer than the OGs. They were here first, the originals. And if they have a story, it's because they know what the hell it is. It has been passed down. And I feel like they always seem to be pretty um, respectful of their original stories. And so they're not changing them as they pass down. You know what I mean? So, okay, the Mansis have the minks or the minkti, and those are um, formidable forest spirits who are protected by the gods. And to me, anytime the people like the older, older, older stories mention the gods or the people from the heavens, I always think people from space, like the heavens is space. And if anybody's coming from space, that's an alien. It could look like Thor. It could look like a gray person. It could look like a slimy, nasty beast. I don't know, but I just feel like in old legends, if they're saying the gods, it's freaking aliens, okay? So they're saying that they're protected by the gods. 
they describe them pretty much as very angry yeti and a few weeks before the Dyatlov incident um, the Mansi people had a herd of their caribou that were just ripped to shreds and they blamed that on the Minkthi um, or the minks I'm not sure but we're gonna call it yeti from here on out and if you think about like some of the injuries a lot of them came back as crushed in chest like crushed like when you think of a yeti i just feel like if they get mad they're gonna like pick you up and like squeeze you to death right like doesn't that kind of seem like that would fit in with like four broken ribs on one side six on the other tw 10 total in another person like crushed in chest where like discharge is coming out of the mouth i'm just saying like sorry i said discharge sorry i said it again um i just think that one kind of like i don't know that one sticks with me i like the yeti one <laughs> Okay, so when I was looking into to the story, I kind of came up with a little bit of a theory of my own. So I'm going to pop it in the middle and just know that I literally read some stuff, put some things together in my own brain, pulled this out of my butt, and I'm telling you guys about it. It is my opinion. It's not a fact, so don't be going off and telling, like, the Russian bosses over there that I'm talking shit because I'm not, okay? Let's just talk about it. So, Igor, the leader and Zena, the secretary, the one with the diary and taking all the pictures, they were in love. They were together. There was another female, Dubanina, the one that went through freaking hell. Um, she was also on the trip, right? So I just think it's kind of odd that, uh, well, I don't know. You know how girls are. Um, like, you're in love. You see your friend in love. You want to be in love. So I kind of think, what if... Because of their injuries during death, that's the only thing that kind of makes me think to link them together. And I don't know, the age thing, whatever, you know, girls like older guys. So anyway, so I was kind of thinking that um, that maybe Dubanina and the other hiker, who is the 38-year-old gentleman, um, Zolvolotov, I'll put his name up here, um, they both had their eyes removed. And I kind of feel like, oh, also because he was a soldier. He was in World War II. And he was, like, all up in the Soviets' business and military stuff. So what if they, you know, found him? Because when he was found, he had a camera around his neck. And Yudin, Yuri Yudin, the one that, you know, stayed behind and he was helping identify a bunch of stuff at camp, said that he'd never seen that camera. And then all of a sudden, he's accusing this guy of, who was added at the very end of the trek, just added in. All of a sudden, he's going... I don't know, weird, but he w accused him of maybe hiding that camera during the trip. Why would he hide a camera or why would he even like accuse him of hiding it? Like, what's the point? Why would you do that? Doesn't make sense, especially if it's a camera or like a trip that you're trying to doc. Oh, they documented so much. Okay. Going back to the Eddie thing, I just want to jump in real fast. They also had their own newspaper called the... Um, or Torton, the evening or, or Torton, super cute. But the last like headline that they were making for their own little newspaper was, we now know the snowmen exist. And then it was kind of like left at that from the information that I found. But like, what snowmen exist out there? What's happening? I'm just thinking that's kind of weird. But anyways, go back, back, back. So... I digress. Um, we're back to my little, my own theory, right? So I just kind of think it's weird that Yuri accused him of hiding a camera and, and <clears throat> like, what if like it was like, they did some a prom, like some like military shenanigans. And then they're like, Oh, you're the guy that we have this and this and this secret from and or you know this and this so they're like torturing his girlfriend to get it out of him I don't know it's really morbid to think that stuff but sometimes your head goes that way and you bring up your own drama or bring up drama that you just lie about to yourself I don't know you guys what do you think about that do you think that's maybe it holds a little water I don't know I don't know I don't want to like accuse people but I just think it's kind of weird that he's 38 years old and he's on a track with a bunch of 20 year olds like I'm 32 and I don't really want to hang out with a bunch of 20 year olds just kidding I will okay I'm just looking for a brush sorry okay and then about the government being pretty shady so they had rushed 
the investigation so much that it really had the families questioning a lot. And then again with them being so weird about the funerals and having like undercover um, soldiers at the funerals. Like why would you need to do that? Why? Like what's even the point of having undercover agents just go to the freaking funeral? Like it's a funeral. These people were tortured it seemed like or they went through hell either way. Their deaths were horrific. Whether you froze to death or you were freaking crushed to death, their deaths were rough, right? So why be weird about the funeral? And then in December of 1959, so the same year of the incident, um, <clears throat> the U.S. Embassy sends a <clears throat> document dated December 10th, 1959 um, with regulations. And this is what, let me see. I want to tell you guys exactly what it says. Okay. So the, I'm going to put the document up here because it is a legit ass document that I did see. So this document, this, hold on. Okay, real fast before I get into the document. Um, I just thought it was kind of funny. So let's talk about it. So they have this huge investigation of these nine hikers that got just obliterated. And then they have these weird documents that your Yudin saw about an early search before the investigation even started. And then uh, they're really weird about the funerals, right? And um, given the family's hard times about getting the bodies, all of that, but um, like they, so they closed the mountain for three years, wouldn't let people go up there. They still to this day advise people to not hike in groups of nine on that mountain. That's kind of strange, right? Like if you're eight or 10, it's fine. Seven, you're good. 11, you're good. Nine, you're probably going to die horrific deaths just saying so just keep an eye out watch out and keep them in even numbers which being even numbers anyways why are you being on so that's kind of a weird thing right like why would you make that kind of a regulation for when you open up the mountain like uh no groups of nine just don't even do it like maybe that's just in poor taste i don't know i, I guess i can kind of get that so um so I'm going to try to read you guys what this document says while I do my mascara. So the document is titled Regulations Covering Mountain Climbing Expeditions in Nepal Relating to Yeti. Why? Let's talk about that for just one quick second. What? There's like a legit ass document. So we didn't even start having real like diplomatic conversations with Nepal until 1947. And then still then we didn't really like communicate a bunch about it. From what I read, I don't know a lot about history and how our communication with Nepal and all that went. So don't come at me. Okay. I'm just saying from what I read, I did do some research on it. And from what I read, we didn't really have a lot of like big documented communication from when we started diplomatic communication with them from in 1947. Look at me knowing some shit. And now all of a sudden, there's my baby. There, now all of a sudden we have this document with like regulations about Yeti. Like that's, all right, let's start a relationship. Okay, so um, it had three regulations that people had to abide by if they wanted to this you know decide to have an expedition in search of yeti and i will tell you what those three things are give me one second okay so to be able to have an expedition to go in search of a yeti you have to register with the i almost said napoleon government I'm so sorry if that's disrespectful. That's, I don't know, that was pretty funny, but I don't think they're called the Napoleon government. So government of Nep Nepal, you would have to pay 5,000 in Indian currency. And then um, you have, that's how much it would cost to get a permit. And the permit is a uh, permit for expedition in search of Yeti. So it's like, you're straight up telling them like, hey guys, we're gonna go look for the Yeti. But like you can't just plan that with your buddies and go to the mountain and be like, dude, let's go find some Yeti. You know, like you have to 
go and make it like a huge issue with the government and make it like a big deal. But I thought that wasn't like a thing. Like I thought the government was like, yeah, they don't exist. They don't exist. Bull shikes. So that's condition number one. Um, and then number two, if you capture a Yeti, um, you can only capture it either, you know, like harness it, ensnare it, however you capture a freaking creature. I don't know why I keep doing this. And then you have to, or you're like, if you capture them on film or anything like that, but you are not allowed to shoot at or kill the Yeti unless it is in self-defense. So if you see a Yeti, you're like, oh my gosh, no, you can't just like shoot at it to freak it out or shoot at it and kill it for no reason. It has to be like attacking you for you to have any right to kill it, which I freaking agree. Like, why are you trying to kill a Yeti? Just to be a jerk. Okay. And then, um, that all, so yeah, you're not allowed to kill them. You can only capture them and all film and or the creature itself has to be given to the government at the soonest possible, like, as soon as possible. Get that information to the government first. That's the second condition. Condition number three, my ashes. Okay, and then the third condition was, and I'm going to read this word for word from the actual document. It says, new news or reports shedding light on the actual existence of the creature um, must be submitted to the government of Nepal as soon as possible um, and are not and must not in any way, must not in any way are the words used, uh, be given to the press or be used for publicity or reporters for publicity without permission from the government of Nepal, the Napoleon government. And okay, just think about that for a second, okay? Why, like, I seriously, like, did you guys know that you can't just like go and look for like Yeti and Bigfoot? Do you guys feel like Yeti and Bigfoot are like cousins, like, like the, the grizzly bear is like the cousin of the cold polar bear, like, you know, it's like the opposites or whatever. Like, do you think that's legit? Is that how it is? Because I've always just thought that Bigfoot and Yeti were just cousins and like one's for the cold and one's for the warm, you know, like, I don't know. Because I know in America we have Bigfoot, obviously. I wonder if we have a government rule, like, do we have to like... That's what I want to know. Do we have to go and tell the government, like, hey, I want to go find Bigfoot. Do you guys, are you guys okay with that? Are you cool with that? I don't know. Like, I think we should actually be able to just go look for Bigfoot. But maybe we shouldn't look for him, honestly. But I just, okay, I just think all my whole life, I just thought that the government's like, oh, yeah, that's an urban myth. It's an urban legend. It's not real. There's no Bigfoot. There's no Yeti. There's no snowman. The abominable snowman and the Yeti is the same, right? But I've kind of, as I got older, um, I've heard that Bigfoot is actually like, it's like a form of like an alien species and they actually send that species down here to try to kind of figure out that link between us and them or I don't know. I just, what if that's like the link between like us and like the gorillas or whatever? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. Didn't vent them. Do you guys like my hair? I know it's kind of like growing it out and it looks like a trash bag, but this is all I got. Anyways, so. <clears throat> um, I've, just, I've always heard that, not always heard, but I have recently heard that, uh, that Aliens can use like our caves for like, I don't know, like as a wormhole or like a, like a travel thingy to like get from one area to another area really like easily. And, uh, I've also heard that there's, hold on, let me just do this without talking. So I've also recently heard that, um, usually there's, when there's a sighting of Bigfoot, there are also sightings of like UFOs and stuff like that. And so I just think that's kind of strange that with a whole Yeti mystery, there's those orbs and then the government wanting to like keep that quiet. I don't know. I don't know. Kind of weird. And then, uh, I don't know. I just think the whole, like that whole document there, I just think that's like, I don't know. It kind of makes me just think that Yeti's like legit. 
because why would they have a document about it? Why would they make such a big deal about it? I just think that's crazy. So that, oh no, actually there's more after that. So in February of 2008, six survivors of the original search party um, got together with 31 technical analysts and they uh, did, got all the evidence that they could and they put it all together and they went through it, combed through it, combed through it, combed through it, and they came to the conclusion, they came to the conclusion that the deaths were likely the unintended result of a secret military test. So they did a whole ass investigation with technical analysts and people that were actually on site when they found the campsite and that's what they came back with and I think that's pretty, I don't know, pretty scary. And I want to say that Yuri Yudin had a lot to do with that. Um, I want to say he was a part of that investigation. And then um, one last thing is that there was always the theory of avalanche. They've disproved this. Um, but then, Kate, okay, it doesn't make sense to me. Why, if there's an avalanche, are there people's eyes that they can tell were, like, ripped out? And then, like, the tongue was ripped out. Like, how does an avalanche rip out your tongue? I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. And then, on top of that, how do you have a tent that's, like, shredded in the middle and then the two poles standing up straight? Like, how does an avalanche not knock that over completely? It doesn't make sense to me. How are they not all completely buried and how did they have time to dig a hole and then push down the bird brands? Like an avalanche doesn't make sense to me. And um, they kind of disproved it a long time ago. There's another one called the Carmen Vortex Theory. I think that is a pretty cool theory. Uh, but I don't, I don't understand it enough to explain it to you guys. So definitely do look into it if you want to do your own research on it. Um, and then in 2020, they... Uh, they reopened the case for investigation and they solved it. They came back and just said it's a slab um, avalanche. So it's not like some sort of government thing, you guys. That's silly. And it's definitely not like a Yeti thing, you guys. That's crazy. It's not aliens or anything like that. It's just a slab avalanche. So just so you guys know, it was solved. It's not a crazy mystery or anything like that. Right? Right? Okay, so that is my story. That is a story that has been bugging me f since I heard about it about a year ago. If you are interested in it, I definitely do look into it. Um, I hope that you guys did like this story. Um, I do plan on doing another one, so hopefully that works out. I really like talking to you guys and just talking and talking and talking, and this is something that interests me and gets kind of stuck in my head, so why not talk about it? Um, other channels that do stuff like this that have definitely inspired this is um, obviously Bailey and Sarian. If you don't know her, I will link her information down below, but what are you doing? Like, definitely get into Bailey. And then I do love the Morbid podcast. Um, those girls are hilarious. And then a lot of information I got from today was uh, from research about the like the whole diet law. They have a whole website about it. But then also Let's Get Dark is a podcast. I'll link their information down below as well. Um, yeah, but I hope you guys did like today's story. Well, not like enjoyed it or anything like that, but isn't it interesting? Doesn't it kind of get your head thinking a lot? I don't know. I still think it's like the aliens with the Yeti and like the government's trying to cover it up, but it's a slab avalanche, obviously. Duh. Thanks so much for your time, you guys. Um, if you have not done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell so YouTube lets you know every time I upload a video. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Um, I'm sorry my videos are few and far between. I had surgery and had my appendix removed and I'm still recovered from that. But today is my first day filming 100% and I'm super excited about it. So have a great weekend, you guys, and I will try to get this uploaded as soon as possible. Bye-bye.